Ladies and gentlemen, and dear students, this day, Sunday the 28th April, is a red letter day in the history of Dalhousie Public School, Dalhousie. We have with us His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Nobel Laureate, and one of the greatest spiritual leaders of the 21st century. It's been our ultimate desire for a very, very long time to have His Holiness step into our campus. But His Holiness has unlimited engagements all around the world. And it is so very kind of him to find time for us. We are indeed very blessed. In fact, we couldn't have asked for a greater blessing. It's my personal belief that when great personalities step into somebody's house, they leave goodness in abundance and the recipients of that goodness are propelled into steep trajectory. We at DPS are blessed today. And I can assure all the students that we have a great future now. Ladies and gentlemen, the basics of goodness have not changed over the centuries. Sincerity, kindness, a word of honor, a degree of integrity, a sense of commitment, these values are all as valuable today as they were centuries back. But ever so often, mankind tends to get derailed from these great qualities. And that is when great personalities like His Holiness are born to put the humanity back on track and put billions of individuals and set their moral compass right. His Holiness has innumerable awards, prizes, honorary doctorates, he has visited all the top best universities of the world and delivered talks and lectures. And his message has always been very clear, that of peace and harmony, non-violence, inter-religious understanding, universal responsibility and compassion. His Holiness has authored more than 75 books, and you'll be very happy to know that at one time, two of his books were simultaneously among the top 10 bestsellers of the world, Art of Happiness and Ethics for the New Millennium. 
We are very lucky that His Holiness is going to deliver a talk to you on a very beautiful and a very unique subject, educating the heart. Beethoven, the famous symphonist, once, was once asked by somebody as to what made his symphony so powerful. And his reply was, from the heart it has sprung, and to the heart it will penetrate. So please be ready for a great impact of the talk from His Holiness. The presence of His Holiness on our campus has charged the entire atmosphere like a storage battery. We are so blessed that there is so much energy and vibrancy on this entire campus this afternoon. And this will stay with us for our lifetime. Last but not the least, I would like to express my deep gratitude to His Holiness for having stepped into our campus. It's the opportunity of a lifetime for each one of us. And I assure you, sir, with this faith and trust, we will move forward and carry your messages, carry your goodness with us. Thank you so much, sir. I will now request his Holiness to kindly come and bless the audience. Thank you so much. Dear young brothers and sisters, <clears throat> I'm extremely happy uh, having meeting with, I think, a big number of young students. I always feel when I meet young people, young students, I, a person now nearly 78 year old, I sometimes feel become younger and mixing with young people. <laughs> so, indeed, great honor. Uh, you arrange this opportunity, meet people, young people, young students. Then, you know, the Damsara, Damsara, the Dalahousi, uh, even higher than Damsara. So, and a lot of trees, really beautiful. So then, when I look, look at you, I feel we already in heaven, angels. <laughs> Quite. <laughs> and then, Look around, around where. Uh, uh, then, yes, this is uh, modern India. Uh, the generation whose shoulder, whose on whose shoulder, on whose shoulder, the great, bright future India. We Tibetan, since 7th century, 8th century, Buddha Dharma reached Tibet directly from India. And particularly 
Buddha Dharma, which kept through centuries in Nalanda institution. The one of the Nalandas, as I think during 8th century, 7th century, I think one of the uh, most prominent sort of uh, scholars. His name, uh, Shandarakshida. He invited by the Tibetan emperor in 8th century. He introduced Buddhism according to Nalanda tradition. So therefore, uh, I always uh, describe you Indian. Historically, our guru, we are Chela. And sometimes I also see uh, expressing, we are not only Chela, but reliable Chela. <laughs> that means in this country, in your own I said the Guru's own land. Recent centuries, a lot of ups and downs. During this period, your knowledge, your rich sort of tradition, and, and man, of, wisdom tradition. Ah, wisdom tradition. Uh, we kept intact. So, uh, it is sufficient reason to describe ourselves as a reliable chela. <laughs> so our relation is not economy reasons or political reasons, some other reasons, but mainly spiritual level. Very sort of close link. So sometimes now these days. I also describe myself as a son of India. Reason, my thought here, and my brain, every sort of particle of my brain filled by Nalanda thought. Since uh, I, I start study, uh, age at six, seven. Most important text which we study. Firstly, we memorize all these texts. Then explanation word by word. Then through dialectical debate, through that way we study. So every part of my brain cells filled by Nalanda thought. Then this physical. Now over uh, 53 years, since 59, uh, this body survived by Indian dals, Indian rice, Indian chapati. <laughs> so therefore, <laughs> mentally, physically, I really feel son of India. So therefore, when I look India, Bharat, not only in, I think ancient time, I think India truly produced, I think most brilliant sort of human, brilliant human mind, I think produced from this country over four, three, four, four five thousand years. Uh, then, certainly, most ancient religious tradition with rich philosophical sort of also the, the background, that also, I think, last over three thousand years. This country is produced. So as a result, now today, say today, 21st century, India is the only country where all major religious traditions live together. Beside homegrown different religious traditions, all different religious traditions, different parts come from 
a different part of the world, or establish here and live together peacefully. I think a true sense of spiritual brothers and sisters truly exists in this country. So I always is telling people, India is the model of all different religious traditions lived together in the spirit of genuine harmony. This is, I think, one of the greatness of this country. And then modern time, say, since 47, this country, if you compare neighboring states, I think in this country, not only most populated democratic country, but also very stable, very peaceful, very harmonious. Of course, few occasions, some problems. That's quite understandable. A country where uh, over billion populations, some mischievous people are always there. That's understandable. But overall, I think this country is really uh, peaceful, uh, stable, democratic country, and rule of law. Sometimes here and there, little drawbacks there, <laughs> but that's understandable. <laughs> but overall, I think a wonderful modern nation. So these are the basis of your further development, not only material field, but also spiritual field, and can be, I think, really as well, uh, model or example, good example, where I think on this planet, seven billion human beings. Firstly, I think generally we carry, we facing some kind of moral crisis in different part of the world. In Europe, and South and North America, and Africa, and Middle East, and the rest of Asia, there are some problems. So the inner value, I mainly stress the India's thousand-year-old tradition of secular ethics. In many countries, the very word secular, people sometimes a little uncomfortable. And then, because you see, people believe ethics, moral ethics, must be based on religious faith. But in this country, over 3,000 years, You see, the concept of secularism already there. And that means respect all religion and no preference of this religion or that religion. And also respect non-believer. I think that is something very unique, very special. Some my Indian friend, like a former deputy prime minister, Advani, told me that over 3,000 years, you see, India has a tradition, respect non-believer. Although there are views among the sort of what's the philosopher debate and so what's they condemn. But people who hold that view refer Rishi, means sage. So there is what's the concept of respect, even non-believer. So that kind of what is the secular ethics is very much relevant to today's world. And then religious harmony. As I already mentioned, different all major traditions live together here. So in these two fields, promotion of secular ethics. And secular ethics uh, related with nonviolence, ahimsa. Ahimsa means not out of fear, nonviolence, or restrain, harming other. Out of fear, not that. Or out of indifferent, no. You fully committed, serve, or in action but 
never commit harmful action, violence. So that's ahimsa. So ahimsa, in order to carry practice of ahimsa, tremendous self-competence and inner strength. Weak person, too much emotional person, difficult to practice ahimsa. So ahimsa is your thousand year old your tradition. That reaches harmony, thousand year old your tradition. So now I want to, to point out modern education, extremely important. Last say, you see, several decades since independence. I think modern education at education facility is year by year improving. Now, including here, I think uh, a lot of students, a lot of sort of schools, wonderful. Yeah. So if you simply pay attention about modern education alone, it's not sufficient. Then you will not be fully Indian. As I mentioned earlier, you have your own, I said, the old tradition. These two, ahimsa and religious harmony, these are not only ancient tradition, but also very relevant to today's world. So therefore, while you pay attention, more attention about modern education, you also you see, pay some attention about your thousand year old your tradition. Then in Indian tradition, the practice of shamatha, vipassana, all ancient Indian tradition, these practice there. So logically, where tradition, where practice of shamatha and vipassana, automatically, a lot of explanation about our mind. In modern, even in modern psychology, it's a modern sort of what's the, the specialist about brain, very much lacking the knowledge about emotion, about mind. So you have uh, already, I think, quite rich knowledge in, in Indian sort of tradition the, about mind, about emotion. According to my own experience, now nearly 30 years, I had sort of in, serious engagement with modern scientists, uh, medical scientists, and also brain specialists, and also psychology in this field. Our tradition, or say the, the knowledge, right? knowledge about mind, about emotion, then how to tackle this emotion through mindfulness or through shamatha, through vipassana. Extremely useful. So these you must keep in your mind. So some of these Ancient knowledge is very, very relevant to today's world. Where yeah. some mental problem, mental crisis there, the knowledge about mind, sometimes I call map of mind, map of emotion, that we must, uh, must study. Once we have fuller sort of picture of emotion and mind, and the system of these negative emotions, destructive emotion. Once you have fuller sort of picture, or knowledge of fuller picture, then much easier to deal. Then not necessarily rely on some problems here, develop, then relying on tranquilizer, or alcohol, or drugs. No, without relying external means. Through your own sort of mental level, so you can, oh sorry, uh, you can deal this destructive emotion. So that's a part of India's ancient culture, ancient education. So many education centers in the West, 
and also, I mean, Europe or America. Uh, now many educationists and also scientists really showing uh, serious interest how to deal with mental crisis. So you already have this sort of kasoda knowledge already there. Now this younger generation, please pay more attention. So sometimes I call hygiene of physical as well as hygiene of emotion. It is very important. According to some scientists, usually you see, we, we, so we express healthy body very much related with healthy mind. So we need some kind of sort of study about how to take hygiene of emotion or mind. The healthy mind not come through prayer or, or simple meditation, but the healthy mind come through full of knowledge how to deal with or say the, the destructive emotions. So therefore, this uh, is something very, very, very important. Then, you see, this education, this kind of education, if we carry with religious belief, then the, it never be universal, universally acceptable. Because there's no one, I mean, no one single religion sort of great, great sort of, uh, however great, but never be universal. So secular ethics can be universal. And also secular ethics can be taught in secular education field. So my young, I said the Indian friend here, yeah, please think more. In other words, education brain, simultaneously education home heartedness. It's not talking about next life or nirvana. Simply, how to build healthy human beings, healthy family, healthy community, and through that way, healthy humanity. Obviously, a lot of problems which we humanity facing, major portion of that problem is essentially man-made problem, our own creation. So therefore, the logically, since this problem created by human ourselves, so therefore we must have ability to, to reduce this problem if our mental thinking is correct or long-sighted and holistic. Then certainly uh, we can reduce this, these, these problems. And eventually, if we make attempt constantly through education, perhaps next generation, uh, after that generation, I think within this 21st century, I think we can build happier world, peaceful world, not through prayer, but through education. I think it's very possible. In that respect, I think India should lead. That uh, real, I, I, so I, I hope, and I, I believe you can do it. That, and then I usually see mentioning my generation, uh, and also I think principal. That uh, I think we are more or less I think same generation, little bit younger I think than me, <laughs> but in any way our generation belongs to 20th century, so our century already gone. So people who belongs that century now eventually say goodbye. <laughs> we have to, we have to say bye bye. So this generation, you, young, bright, uh, you are truly generation of 21st century. So now 21st century, just at the beginning, one decade 
past, but almost now nine decades uh, yet to come. So, future always possible. Something, something change can be possible. Future is something like space. Past already happened. We can learn experience from memory. Otherwise, nothing can be done. Future still in our head. So this generation, 21st century generation, now future of the world is in your own hand. Then particularly future of India is in your own hand. So therefore, you need visions and more sort of uh, so the educational knowledge. In order to know the reality, we must look things more wider way or holistic way. You cannot see things, reality, only from one angle. We must look from various angles. So in order to carry that, you see, you need more holistic view. That's very, very important. Then you get the real picture of the reality. Otherwise, there's many problems today here, uh, those man-made problems. Actually, I think th there's huge gap for the reality and appearances. Many mistakes happen because their sort of activities or their action based on appearances, not the reality. So the very purpose of education is try to reduce gap appearances in reality. So in order to know the reality, you must have more holistic sort of view. Uh, so holistic education is something very, very important. Then also in order to see the reality, your mind must be uh, very calm. Too much emotioned mind cannot see the reality. Because your mind already become uh, biased. In order to know the reality, our mind must be very sort of neutral and can see, look objectively. So again, in order to keep calm mind, warm heartedness, very important. Warm heartedness creates inner strength, self confidence. Then our mind become more calm. So these things should not consider as a religious practice. But these things is something we human beings have wonderful potentials there. Now we must real, we must utilize this sort of potential. In order to utilize this potential, we should have more knowledge about these potentials. Clear. So that I want to, uh, to share with you. And then, Dala Hausi, quite close with Dharamsala. I think uh, in future, occasionally, I think we may have opportunity to meet. When you a little grown up, then I think we, we may have uh, another occasion come. Then, then I will check what, uh, since our meeting, what your sort of today effort about this point, whether seriously implement or not, I will check you. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. And then, of course, uh, the concerned people, you see, really organized this uh, very well, uh, really very, very attractive way. And, and most important, every person's sort of face seems, you see, full of joy, smile, smile. So I really love smile. Smile is, I think, one of the unique things about a human being. Maybe some monkey, I think you observe some of the monkeys in this area, whether they have the ability to show smile or not. Uh, otherwise, I think smile is really unique human sort of what's today. Kasoda? Human sort of what's ha. Capacity. Capacity. And then I must uh, 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 make clear, smile also, our sort of brain is, I think children's smile, I think really genuine human smile. 
like me and like, like this generation, better education, then sometimes the, our specific brain, sometimes that good quality also utilized for scastic smile or uh, cheating smile, diplomatic smile. <laughs> so such smile sometimes you see, creates more suspicion, more fear. So I think we human brain sometimes you see ability to spoil some of these good things. So uh, I really love smile. I always you see uh, when I meet someone, I always consider a human being, no differences. Now here I'm talking to you. I just simply consider myself as another human being. Uh, quite old person, age differences, but the same people. Mentally, emotionally, physically, we are the same. As soon as I consider myself, I am something different. Perhaps I consider I, I myself as a sort of holy Dalai Lama. That kind of attitude creates distance from you. What do you use that? We are meeting human beings. On that level, entire seven billion human beings are the same. Different nationality, different races, different caste, different religious faith are secondary level. Many problems, man-made man -made problem, not based on oneness of human being, but secondary level of differences. On that, on that level, we create a lot of divisions, a lot of conflict, you see, come from that. So time comes, we must think about humanity. The entire seven human being is one. Our future depends on the rest of the humanity. So that's the reality. Now think more, your, your thinking. Not only you see concentrate in Dalhousie or Himachal, but think whole India, then whole Asia, then whole world. That's very important. Since you have great potential to make significant contribution for humanity, so you must think broadly. That's very, very important. Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful speech from heart to heart, transcending all generations. I'm partly from the 20th and hopefully still partly 21st century. So I think we also learned a lot. As a musician and student of music and life itself, I would like to hear your thoughts on the role of music and arts in the education of the heart. It might be silence as well, because I think always there is music in silence, and the best music has a lot of silence. Thank you. <laughs> Naturally, you are a musician, so this question is very relevant to you. But for I'm not a musician, so I don't know. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> I think your question asked the wrong person. I don't know. And anyway, this sort of artistic, artistic work, I think one important instrument, or two kasa, that means, kasa, that means, the linking, channel, medium, or channel, music, songs, you see, uh, much depends on the meaning. If you carry the meaning, some sort of inner peace, harmony, sameness of humanity, uh, you see, sometimes you see, through music, through, through songs, may affect more. If you see music, songs, you see, they carry the meaning of too much nationalism, too much hatred, then very harmful. That much I know, otherwise I don't know. Then next question. Next question. Good afternoon, sir. 
it is said that happiness comes from within we all crave for happiness if it is within us why can't we always be happy now pleasure happiness there are two different categories one mainly physical level seeing something nice hearing something nice taste smell kasa touch these are sensorial consciousness sensorial experiences so certain mental joyfulness happiness satisfaction come through these uh, sensorial level is not long lasting and not very important uh, the certain sort of satisfaction or joyfulness through mental level that can remain long lasting and more important because obviously physical illness now here i think example the physical level i think sometimes i think the when is the sun too hot you feel uncomfortable physical level but mental level if you feel interest if you feel fresh then physical uncomfortable suddenly can subdue by mental sort of satisfaction mental joyfulness clear now other hand mental worry mental sort of pain never subdue by physical comfort clear so the experience on mental level is much more important superior i think the modern life the materialistic life see see really seems to see uh too much because of consider the importance of sensorial level experiences so i think one sort of example the people when they concentrate about mind they cannot remain there even a few minutes impossible and those people who have no experience or no knowledge about inner value then without seeing television or without hearing some music their life become very boring these are the the lack of experience and the lack of knowledge about our inner value clear then the overall joyfulness happiness i usually consider very purpose of our life is happy life reason is quite simple our life very much depend on hope no guarantee but only hope hope means for good so for good something best something good once you see people really lost hope give up hope then that very mental attitude shorten our life at worst case kasoda even suicide so therefore uh, we can say very purpose of all exist is for happiness person who have more mental peace more happier then the physical become much healthier and eventually live longer clear so like that so therefore i think there is reason that so happy happiness is our right to achieve happy life so very purpose of your education for happiness not for trouble <laughs> isn't it uh, so now the qu- question is i think it is important make distinction sensory level mental level uh, mental le- sensory level no i think generally speaking no sort of negative emotion this destructive emotion and constructive emotion are mental level not conscious level clear ha ha 
sensorial. Uh, sensorial, sensorial sort of uh, level experience like that. So, so pay more attention about that. Hmm? I have always been speaking the prayer, Om Mani Padme Hum, but without actually knowing what it means. I have, uh, I have been asking this question to many of my elders, but I failed to get the answer. So, what does it mean? Prayer, and also recitation of mantra. Just to simply repeat the sound, not much help. Uh, I, and particularly, Om Mani Padme Hum is one Buddhist mantra. So the whole Buddhist system is utilize human intelligence maximum way through that way transform our emotion. That's Buddhist way of approach. The other tr tr tradition, most of these theistic religion, mainly through faith, through prayer, to God, to Creator. It also immense powerful, wonderful thing. All major religious tradition, she carries same message or same practice. That's practice of love, compassion, forgiveness, tolerance, self-discipline. Same. Then most of the theistic religions, you see, prayer, prayer, yeah. prayer is most important. Buddhist Buddha stated, you are your own master. Your future entirely depends on yourself. So in Buddhism, Buddha taught study is very, very important. Knowledge is very important in order to utilize human intelligence fully. We have to know how to use. And in order to utilize, you must know the mental function, mental system, these things, as I mentioned before. So, you pay more attention, study what is the Buddhist system. Then, with understanding about the whole system, transformation of our mind, with that sort of clear sort of day, full of knowledge, and ultimate aim and sincere motivation, then carry recitation of this mantra is very useful. Clear? Oh, Mani Pema Hong. Of course, I don't know whether relevant explain here or not, I don't know. But you see, the six syllabus, six syllabus. Om Ma Ni Pe Me Hum. So Om, that sort of mantra is common, Buddhism and also many different Hinduism, Om. But here Buddhists is explain, Om here three uh, letters are Om. That represent our body, and mind, speech. So there are see, two levels, body, speech, mind, impure level, that creates, uh, that's the basis of suffering. So therefore, the experiencer, the experiencer, pains and pleasure, the body, mind, mainly body and mind, trans transform into pure, Pleasant, ever pleasant, ever pleasant, right? ever pleasant body and mind. You see, the body, mind, and then automatically speech also. So that represent our Om. Om represent Kasoda. Impure level, impure part, and pure part. Now, how to transform impure part into pure, right? Three impure, the transform into pure three. Then money and payment. Money means jewel. Here jewel meaning altruism, infinite altruism. Then padma. Padma means wisdom. So 
altruism and wisdom combine. That represents whom? Whom carry meaning of com combination? Altruism and wisdom combine. Through that way, that's the proper way, method to purify three impure in order to become pure three, body, speech, and mind. Clear? <laughs> like that. <laughs> Next question. What is important, to be religious or a good human? <clears throat> is it important to be religious when there is such a turmoil around the world over religion? Uh, I think the very purpose of religion is to produce sensible human being, more compassionate human being. That's why all major religious traditions always talk love and compassion, forgiveness, these things. So therefore, person without religion simply try to become sensible human being, warm heart human being, then very good. Recently I saw one report out of seven billion human human being, about one billion human being, formerly they consider non-believer. Then, out of six billion, uh, no, six billion human being, suppose believer, but among those believer, lot of mischievous sort of people there. <laughs> Religion become lip service, not really implement in their daily life. So that is clearly a sign. They suppose they follow religion, but, but without genuine sort of effort for improve their selves, they them, themselves. Otherwise, you see, religious believer must be honest, truthful, compassionate. Then religious people even sometimes use religion to create more problem to gain some benefit to oneself. Sometimes religion creates more sense of we and they. Actually, that is the source of problem. Even within family, if you create some kind of barrier, they and we, then eventually distrust, anger, and one side also, you see, eventually create loneliness. So, once we develop strong sort of self, uh, regard, because the, no consider about other, then automatically that person become lonely, lonely in deep insight, lonely feeling. That creates depression. Think more other. As a human brother, sisters, that attitude uh, reduce distance. That reduce, I say, the sus because of the suspicion. When you develop genuine sense of sense of concern of others' well-being, then no room of anger, no room of hatred, no room of fear. So these things, no matter what person believes religion or not, these are something very, very important. So therefore, uh, I say, I think these basic values, basic principles are more important than, <coughs> oh, than ceremony or justice, ritual things, like that. If, if anyone who really develop full conviction through their own experience, this deeper value, then all this religion, you see, use different method in order to promote this inner value. Then you can see real religious value. And with that conviction, follow religion is good. Without that conviction, except religion, sometimes I describe religion also teaches hypocrisy. Saying nice thing, 
love, compassion, God, these things. But in dangerous life, not much concern about these things. <laughs> we Buddhists also, you see, sometimes you see, you know, saying very nice things, uh, but doing just like the ordinary people. So that's a hypocrisy, isn't it? Next question. Good afternoon, sir. You have a very busy schedule. How do you manage to get time for yourself? Do you aspire for some private moments? Oh, each night, eight, nine hours sleep. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> I get up about around three morning. Then some meditation, some mainly analytical meditation, analyze. Uh, myself, about mind, about body, about feeling, about other, about troublemaker, about your friend, and the whole phenomena, analyze. What's the nature? Well, try to develop holistic view. That very, very helpful. And then, of course, including recitation of Om Mani Peme Hong. <laughs> also, I recite, of course, daily. <laughs> Add some other mantras, some other sort of visualizations. And it take about my sort of meditation, uh, take about five hours every day. So, then, uh, meeting, talk, like that. And all these, my activities, you see, carried with motivation. I dedicate my body, speech, mind, well-being of others as a Buddhist practitioner. So that really brings some kind of satisfaction here. So, uh, so I have, I think, plenty of time for relax, right? <laughs> Long live His Holiness. Good afternoon, sir. Thank so you. my question is, why it is important to educate the herd? Why not to the brain? As I mentioned earlier, wisdom is kind of intelligence. That mainly comes from brain. Modern existing education, very much helpful to develop that. That alone not sufficient. Therefore, we must pay more attention about education of warm-heartedness. Those troublemakers, as far as their, their brain is concerned, very smart. But because, you see, lack of moral ethics and no hesitate to harm other people, kill other people. These people, even history, past history, those, I think, as the people who really now become Kasoda, the history sort of figure, something very merciless for people. As far as their brain is concerned, many of them very smart. So education alone, or knowledge alone, whether can be constructive or destructive, not very sure. And personally also, great sort of educated person, sometimes a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, and loneliness, and suspicion. So brain education, will not eliminate or reduce these things. Only warm-heartedness. Next question. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, sir. You are revered the world over as a guru. Sir, would you be kind enough to tell us whom do you consider as your guru? Guru? Of course. I have uh, seven, 18, 18 different gurus. That means Teacher, uh, or as I mentioned earlier, around six, seven years old, I already started 
study. So teacher, there are sort of the teaching subjects, right? Teaching subject, all those great Indian philosopher or thinkers sort of writing. And this also, you see, uh, what's the uh, spiritual teacher. So therefore, this I, I consider my guru. Then, person who I have some sort of admiration, of course, Mahatma Gandhiji. Uh, then, uh, Mahatma Gandhiji I never met, but Dr. Rajendra Prasad, first Indian president, oh, wonderful person. Although I didn't sort of receive any sort of spiritual teaching or something, but a wonderful person. I have great admiration, respect. Then, uh, some others, of course, some European leaders, like President Havel, Czechoslovakia, a wonderful person. And something, and Willy Brandt, I admire him, like that. So there are some, some people. Then as a human being, I consider Mao Zedong, also you see, great person, great revolutionary person. <laughs> like that. <laughs> oh, next question. Thank you, sir. Uh, I want to ask you that, can peace be attained by force? As in our class, uh, teachers tell us to be quiet. How do we at our age uh, address quietness as a, a step towards peace? Peace or violence or non-peace, right? Mainly related with mental level. Now, for example, violence and non-violence, ultimate demarcation, violence, non-violence, is not based on action, verbal action, physical action, but based on motivation, more compassionate motivation. No matter what appearance is about physical action, verbal action, so long, or say the compassionate motivation there is non-violence. Other hand, a nice word, or sort of physically smile, and including some gift, and a lot of praise, praising, nice word. But motivation, try to cheat try to deceive that person, try to take advantage or try to exploit that person, is essentially violence, clear. So now peace means not just, you see, no sound, remain like that, and worst thing, out of fear. <laughs> Teacher carried discipline for a disciplinary measure, and if you because if, if you make noise, some kind of disciplinary action, that peace is out of fear, not genuine peace. Peace must come from voluntary, with certain conviction, uh, no matter what sort of external sort of appearances, but inside mental level, complete peace, calm. And peace, Mental peace and self-confidence, inner strength is very, very connected. Right. Combination, like that. Clear. So I also, when I carry study, sometimes, you see, my teacher shows a little bit of negative face. Then I also, you see, remain, looks more peaceful. That is out of fear, not a genuine peace. As soon as teacher, uh, Go on. Oh, you, you, may, you may shout like that. <laughs> so that was, that was used. Something, any action uh, must come from conviction. That means from volunteer. So all this good action, out of compulsory way, not very effective, must come through volunteer.
from conviction. Next question. Good afternoon, sir. We are all inspired by people in our lives. May I know, sir, by whom have you been inspired and how? I think I have keen interest about quantum physics. So that subject, uh, I have real admiration about uh, Professor David Bohm and also uh, Professor Von Wezeker. I, I learned, I think, a uh, number of lessons from these two teachers. I consider my tutor about quantum physics. I want to tell you, then I usually uh, describe uh, as, as a student of these two professors about quantum physics, I usually describe hopeless student, reason. When they explaining about quantum physics, you see, since I understand something, after finish that lesson, nothing left here. <laughs> so that means hopeless student. <laughs> then, of course, uh, Mahatma Gandhi about nonviolence, and then also the Kasachu with Mr. Kazadi, South Africa, Nelson Mandela. Oh, wonderful! I met. I had opportunity meeting him. Then Bishop Tutu, very religious minded, but after their sort of democratic sort of was a change. Uh, he carry, I think, serious sort of effort about reconciliation. I really admire these things. Like that. Good afternoon, sir. You have been to different places in the world and have interacted with people from all over the world. Sir, according to you, what is that one thing which can solve the problems of different societies in the world? I think that is difficult to say. I think mainly problem related with mind, emotion. So, different mental disposition. Uh, so we have to deal with, uh, I mean, in order to reduce, uh, what's it, uh, destructive emotion, we have to deal the person according his or her mental disposition. So it is difficult, difficult to say. One single sort of word. I think basically, love, compassion. I usually describe that is the universal religion. And we also, biologically, uh, we have that potential. Because now here, I think you, you young student, uh, when you have holiday, vacation, meeting your mother, I think that's best period of joyfulness, isn't it? Or Christmas, or Diwali, some sort of day, Kasa, presents, presents. Uh, to Diwali or Christmas uh, come next few days, then you may have some kind of excitement, isn't it? So you see, we human beings, biologically, we love showing others affection. This is not come from religion, even animal. If we show our affection, of love, they appreciate. These are biological factors. Because we need love, affection. Our very life starts through that way. Entire people here, or seven billion human beings, all come from mother. So therefore, and I mean, we grown up, mother's affection, mother's milk, those people who received maximum affection from mother or from friends at young age, that person, rest of the life, much happier. Deep insight, more self-confidence. Those people 
who, no matter how successful life, no matter how rich, no matter how powerful person, but in deep inside, if the person received less affection, care from their mother, I think whole life, deep inside, some kind of sense of insecurity. That creates fear. That eventually, you see, often easily develop fear. Like that. So these are not come from religion, but biologically. Affection, we already equipped it. Now what we should do is, when we gradually grown up, we must educate. We must nurture these basic human value which come from biological factor. Like that. Which would I? So therefore, I think love, compassion, sense of concern of others' well-being, that biologically already equipped there. Then, through education, further sort of nurture and use the certain good thing from biological factor that further promote through our knowledge. That we can do. So, as I mentioned already, you see, educate about warm-heartedness is very, very essential. Because the basic sort of uh, the concept is love is very, very important in human society. And naturally, we are social animal. Sort of, so that, so do, because bring together, not by force, but by affection. That very relevant as a social animal. So they, so kasa su dhiva kasa. To bring together, not by anger. Anger, expert. Love, bring together. Clear, like that. And physically also, some modern sort of scientist, I think mainly medical scientist, constant fear, constant anger, hatred, actually eating our immune system. So more compassionate mind here, the blood pressure reduce, amount of stress also reduce, like that. So these are scientific sort of research, I mean finding, scientific finding, like that. Good. Next question. Thank you, Your Holiness. With that question, we come to the end of the interaction session. We are sure that the message of peace and the words of enlightenment conveyed by His Holiness will be carried to every corner of the universe and peace, harmony and brotherhood will prevail on this earth. <laughs>